over half a year on from the February quake, we're back in Christchurch to find out how people with disabilities are coping. Whether it's been loss of life or just not being able to access the CBD of the city they love, everyone in Christchurch has been affected. But people with disabilities are particularly vulnerable. Many rely on support services, accessible housing, public transport, and without these systems in place, it can be easy for them to fall to the bottom of the food chain. For some people, it's come to the point that they've decided to move out of their own home or even flee the city. For others, like Jazz Calder, they don't have a choice. After 28 years, she's being forced to start all over again. Since the first earthquake in September, um, the floors have moved in February and June. So now when I'm in my home, if I just sit here like this, I actually don't sit here anymore. I actually go back. <laughs> Back into things. I was in bed and I just woke up with this shaking. And I, it took me a while to work out what was going on. So I've not experienced anything like that. So I, I thought, right, well, I better get out of bed. So I jumped into my chair. Well, I didn't really jump. I kind of <laughs> very carefully maneuvered myself in. And then I was like, I better get some light. So I lit some candles. Everything was still moving. And then when it stopped, I could hear this noise, like water, and it was coming out from underneath my house. And I opened up the front sliders onto my patio. There was a river under my house, yeah. Was there anybody with you? No, I was on my own. And I was really scared. I went back inside and I sat under the doorway between my, my lounge and my bedroom. And I started praying. I was going, please let us get out of this alive. It just took me Following the first quake in September, Jazz yeah, spent seven yeah, weeks away from home staying in a motel. After February's quake, she had to leave her home again. Uh, nope, no way I'm getting in there. Is, is this a new kind of normal? Yeah, it's a new kind of normal, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if someone said to me you were gonna have an earthquake and you would live in a house where your floors ran like this and you couldn't sit still because you would roll, <laughs> or you would be using a chemical toilet like you were camping, I would go, yeah, sure. That's what's happened. I've got a chemical toilet and I've had it for some months now. And so I had a, a like a rubber seat on it. And when I transferred one day, the seat moved and I moved with it. And the next thing I knew, I was sliding down onto the floor. And I looked at my bum and there was this big welt. And it was all red and I thought, oh my God. And then I freaked out. I went, because you know, you know yourself, being in a chair, your bottom is like the you know, if you hurt your bum, then you cannot sit in your chair. So I, I did actually freak out then, and I was like, oh hell, you know, what have I done to myself? Have I injured myself? How does it compare to you think um, being in a chair, like having a disability, how much harder is it? Being in a chair is not an issue. I think when I got home, the hardest thing was being in a motel, to be honest, not being in my own space, not having my home. And so going back home, I had everything around me again. And that was good. And then the second quake came, and then it just tipped everything up again. And then I started really noticing that I was, yeah, that it was affecting me and I was feeling down. So I went on antidepressants and that helped me. And, and I'm still on antidepressants. Quarter 
zones, no-go zones. It's not what we're used to here in New Zealand. But in a way, it's what people with disabilities go through every day. Roadblocks and barriers put up through other people's actions and attitudes. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing to help the people of Christchurch who have disabilities. Um, what we're doing, in particular with our clients, is uh, we're making sure that we can react to any of their needs. Uh, some of the things are quite simple, like they might just need uh, assistance to, with transportation. Um, particularly through or just following the earthquake, we had a, a need for accessible showering, etc. We have a, a facility that has an accessible shower, so we opened that right up um, for people to be able to use that, um, no matter what time of the day. Um, and I think our biggest thing is just to be there to react to any need that they may have. The big thing is just access. You know, people don't understand the difficulty in a normal environment for a person with a disability to get around, uh, whether they be in a wheelchair, whether they be on a Zimmer frame, whether they be sight impaired, hearing impaired or whatever. So in times like this, when you have uh, the infrastructure going down, it just makes it so much difficult. Um, we've seen pictures of cars, for example, in water holes um, all around where the, the ground has just opened up. Um, well, that shows how difficult it is for a person perhaps in a wheelchair. I mean, you just about your possibility of that whole wheelchair disappearing inside a, a sinkhole. Liquefaction is everywhere, and it can literally stop you in your tracks. Water and sand are forced out of the ground from the pressure of the Earth's movement. It's near on impossible to do justice to the liquefaction by trying to explain it or film it. This stuff is everywhere, it's insidious. It's like a thick, wet sand that's all encompassing. Liao Amatunai lives her life with a visual impairment. It means she relies on familiarity and landmarks to negotiate her way around her city. The earthquakes have turned her world upside down. Even your driveway has got cracks all through it, eh? Yeah. Liao and her family have been forced out of their home and now stay with her brother. With the earthquakes, how's, how's it been for you? My gosh, it's been very scary. I just start getting very... I just start to scream and stuff. What's happening with our house? My house is real bad damaged and it's sunken, as you can see. Uh, and as you can see, it's in the red zone, so we're going to try to look for another house for us to live in. The house is sunk. Um, it's, it's more or less it's the land that's the problem because um, a lot of the a lot of it's sunken and the liquefaction and the sand it's just all come out. You've got a sign here, EQC inspector. We have relocated as we have no power or water. We pop in and out. Please contact us. Thanks. Twenty Deville Place. Can you see it? Yeah, that was very scared. Um, we went to Auckland for a break but she didn't want to come back but um, we had to come back home. I thought I was dreaming all of a sudden something happened and I was screaming my sister's name because you see we've all got our own rooms but every, everybody slept in the sitting room I was in my own room and all of a sudden this terrible thing happened and I just didn't know what to do. Did you know what was happening? No. I did not. What did you do? We put up. My sister came in the room and she told me to crawl. So I was almost going to run, but she told me to crawl very fast to the living room and sleep with everybody in the li living room. <clears throat> That's been scary. Yeah, pretty much. Oh, I've had enough. This is ridiculous. I've had enough. Totally have. Did you used to sing in church in the basilica there, on Barbados Street? Yes, I did. Yeah. Do you still, can you still go there? No, because the church is broken.
Christchurch has suffered New Zealand's greatest natural disaster since 1931 in terms of loss of life. They now face the nation's greatest rebuild. But many say it is an opportunity. It's a chance to talk about the concept of universal design, which means creating a city that's accessible for everyone. And it's not just an add-on or an afterthought or putting a ramp at the back of a building. It's about placing the value on everyone being able to access the same environment. Accessibility isn't a tack on, it's not going through the tradesman's entrance. We want to go in through the front door. And here's the opportunity, isn't it? I mean, we have an opportunity to inform the city plan that's going to be developed um, over the next few months. In fact, it's got to be with government in December. Um, this plan has to, has to really say these things, isn't it? That universal design is a, 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 a major feature of it. Um, it's not about putting a ramp at the back of a building. It's about, do you actually even need a ramp if we can all just walk in the front door? <laughs> if we have universal design and an accessible Christchurch, it's going to open up doors in terms of education, employment opportunities, um, recreational opportunities. Um, so it's a natural thing. Ross is vision impaired. His house was damaged in the quakes, but he will be able to repair it. Well, we were, we were in bed for like everybody, 4.30 in the morning, um, and it just started to roll. It builds and builds into a crescendo, and the shaking of the house was just phenomenal. And it was, you know, dark, the power was, was off. It was very scary, because you wondered what your house was going to be like, what, um, what you were going to find when you went outside. Should you go outside? When should you go outside? It was a, a scary time. that out, lamp post in the middle of the water. This water is everywhere, it's not going anywhere. Driving home through the red zone, it's, it's not just what you see, it's the feel of the place. I mean, this place is desolate. None of the lights are on in any of the homes. There's roadworks, the odd light on. And it's a feeling of a ghost town. Quakes, it's like being in an um, off-road road because there's bumps and there's holes and there's cracks and there's liquefaction and there's water and <laughs> so yeah it used to be able to drive 50 around here but I found 30 is the highest you can the most you can do around here you'll see there's also this piping this is for the sewage and um, the water You'll notice that there's a few houses too. I mean, you look at the fences, they're all crooked. You can see they're on leans. Um, there's actually a house up here where the house has actually compl collapsed, completely collapsed. The footpaths are sort of up and down and there's lots of holes. Um, this house here is where my daughter and um, my granddaughters used to live and so they're no longer there. This pump goes 24 hours a day and it's been here since September and it's for the surge. What's happened to this street? Um, basically, it's red zoned, which means we have nine months to make a decision. Do you take the government's offer of hand, last and house and land, or do you take the land offer and work with your insurance company? And then you have a year to move out after that. So basically, within 18, 20 months, I will no longer be living here. And I should feel quite sad about that. Hmm. How many other people on this street will be left here? No one. The whole area is going. Yeah. What will be left? What will happen to it? I have no idea. I'd, I'd like to think it could be a park. <laughs> and I could come back and visit my garden, because I have a beautiful garden. <laughs> My children were brought up here and they went to bird school and my granddaughters went to bird school because they live around the corner too. So my daughter's not only lost her family home that she was brought up in, she's also lost her home too. Yeah. 
So she, yeah, she's in the red zone as well. She's yeah. Like, yeah. 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 So I had always visualised being carried out in a box and that I would lay in that house in, 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 in a coffin and people would celebrate my life in that house and where I had lived. And so that's not going to happen now. And I feel sad about it. I don't have a choice. I've got to go. When the earthquake started, the children were evacuated to the field, but then the liquefaction started and they had to be evacuated back to the car park. How bad was it? It was very bad. It was over their shoes. It was quite frightening. And you've dug the street out a couple of times? We've dug the street out three times now. Um, the liquefaction just keeps occurring. So the liquefaction came across the road and was up to over this wall that was that deep in this place here. Yeah, it was just terrible. Leanne Pascoe's son Aidan has a number of specific learning disabilities. For someone who thrives on routine and already lives with anxiety, the quakes have completely unsettled his life. What do you think about the quakes? I don't like them. Could you tell me about them? Well, after the earthquake actually happens, it's hard to sleep when the aftershocks keep on happening at night. Why? Well, because they always wake you up in bed. Are you scared about them? Not, not most of the time, I just try to go to sleep so I can go up in the morning again. Aidan finds it very difficult to be alone, um, to the point where he now shares a room with Sophie, who's three and a half. He doesn't like to be alone at all. There's a little bit of damage in the room and it unsettles him still. Because he does have a high anxiety level, um, the earthquakes are very, very frightening for him. Children like Aidan like routine, they like stability, and when things like earthquakes happen, it just throws them off completely. They can't cope with the unknown factor. What scares you most? Well, you're never really sure any time what building's strong and what's not. I like which one could fall and which one can't. There's a building which came down under last earthquake over that side over there. It was pretty damaged before it happened. It was already cornered off. And then the last one, the wall gave away and it fell straight down. He has a lot of fears around going to sleep, being on his own, um, what's going to happen, how we're we going to stop it. He have a lot of trouble with sleeping, with eating, mood swings. He's very, very tense all the time. No amount of reassurance seems to, to get through to them. They have to try and work it through themselves. So we, we do try and, and make things as normal as possible and, and just try and reinforce that he is safe. When we go somewhere, we point out the safe place to be before we, we sit down so that he knows that he has options. Are you frightened about any more happening? I don't, I don't want to have like an eight to happen. I don't want to have any more to happen. It's because they've already damaged a lot of buildings as I wanted to go to in this holidays. When I first moved to Christchurch 10 years ago, I had a brilliant, fully accessible council flat to move into. The current tenant, Hane Moki, has been forced to move out. We're coming up on your, on your apartment? Yep, right. Whereabouts is your flat? Right in the corner. The one with all the boarded up windows? Yep. 
Entry to your unit is restricted and in the interest of your safety you may only enter to remove your property in company with a Christchurch City Council representative. We have boarded your unit windows, doors and changed the lock in order to protect your property. How does that make you feel? My gut wrenching because when my memories are here of who I became and who I still am but I can't actually think, oh, when I go into a room, that those memories will never be the same. It's not just memories. I mean, this is a symbol for your independence. This yeah. was life changing. Mm, it was, but I kind of haven't got round to saying my place was life changing because the next place I will go, I will grow and become a better person. I know this is, I mean, a magical place as far as accessibility. It's perfect. Are we ever going to find somewhere as good as this again? Probably not, because this place was ideal for me, but. This place, then there will never be, and it's really hard. The council offered me a place down in Tommy uh, Norman Kirk Court, but I couldn't access the kitchen, so I said no. So now I'm on the waiting list again, and it will take years to get another accessible place. So you just got to grin and bear it, and know that one day there will be an accessible place for me. Do you think like that uh, people with disabilities are, are almost forgotten at times though because everyone is so um, full on dealing with their own problems? Not really, because like every time I walk and I see a bumpy road, the people will often stop. Oh, how, how are you finding the footpath lately, young lady? Mm. And like people will just stop. They're really interested because they haven't seen any mainstream media. Because you have uh, cerebral palsy. Quad, uh, what is it? Um, cerebral palsy, spastic quadriplegia. Yeah. Quadriplegia, yeah. What does that mean? It means I'm really smart, but my body's just a bit <laughs> So you're saying your CP deteriorated, what does that mean? I went into muscle spasm like every couple of hours, and usually I only had like one lot of muscle spasm every day, year or so. And my so your body was seizing up? Yeah. It was like the worst feeling ever. Like in, when, there, when there was a major aftershock, my CP just went, even became even worse. I didn't want to go to the doctor and be put on medication which, because I live my life without as much medication as possible because I live through a healthy lifestyle and stuff. And I thought, if this continues up, I'm going to have to go to the doctor and get some medication. This was my first ever flat and it was done by... I'd been waiting for about a year for my first place and this place was ideal for me. I just lived in a residential facility for like a year yeah, because I'd just run away from home from my abusive family and I just needed a place to decide who I was. I just turned 21, completed an outbound course for my 21st. This place was basically where I grew up and I never thought I'd ever leave it. My hope for Christchurch, we look around, Christchurch is a, is a reasonably flat city. There should be no reason why we can't design buildings that are accessible to everyone. That are people in wheelchairs, that's the elderly, the young mother with a, a pram. So we have an opportunity now to make sure that we could actually lead the world in designing a city that makes it easy for everyone to come into. If you do it now, it doesn't cost that much extra. It will cost a little bit extra maybe, but not that much. If you try to do it afterwards, it's too late. That's when the cost comes in, that's when people say, oh no, 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 too expensive, I'll look for another option. And one of the things, as I say, the, the law says you must make a building accessible. So let's not try and get, go find ways around the law, let's put a hand up and let's get it done correctly now. I grew up in Southland, but Christchurch was my base for seven years in between travelling and while I was at uni. Auckland is home now, but I still feel drawn back to the South Island. I'm certainly glad I wasn't here during the quakes or the immediate aftermath, but there's no denying there's an opportunity to rebuild something great. And I'd like to think I'll be back to be part of it someday. A city broken, but it will mend. A city fallen, but it will rise again. People screaming, weeping in despair but they will smile again.
For from all this devastation, destruction and despair, there will come a strong city, a safe city, a beautiful city, a garden city. My city, our city, Christchurch. So what was it like, Dan, actually being there? It was really sad just to see the city like that. And it can't be easy, like, being disabled and having to live amongst the ruins like that. Yeah, that's right. But this is a chance to rebuild a really accessible city. You know, when, when you have your son in a residential care or a child, I mean, you've, you've got to trust them, you know, with your son's life. It's going to be probably the hardest day of my life and I will be sad to see them go, but I think guilt probably is going to be the hardest thing to deal with. I don't second guess myself with the decision for Jake to be in residential care. It doesn't mean to say it's easy. It was the hardest decision in my life, but it was the right decision for all of us. The plan is that they move on so that we can move on, so that Shiloh and Kane can move on. so proud to win this award. 21 finalists across seven categories have now been chosen for the 2011 Attitude Awards. You'll agree that tonight's celebration is a truly worthwhile recipient. To secure your ticket to the televised black tie event, visit our website, attitudepictures.com. Attitude was made with funding from New Zealand On Air.